This is Saudi Arabia, the land of sun, sea and oil. You may have noticed that the kingdom has featured heavily in the press recently, snapping up stakes in the likes of Facebook and Starbucks, and even making a £300 million bid on the Premier League's very own Newcastle United. Such high levels of spending are nothing new to the kingdom or the estimated 15,000 members of its royal family. Though, since 2016, this emphasis on spending on investments has gained almost as much attention as the gold-plated Ferraris that the kingdom is famous for. In just the first three months of 2020 alone, the kingdom's bought over $8 billion of blue-chip stocks and Western companies. The reason behind this shift to more prudent consumption? Well, that's all to do with one man's vision. Prince Mohammed bin Salman's 2030 vision, to be precise. Back in April 2016, as the prince was on his ascendancy to the throne, he took to the stage to launch Vision 2030, a sweeping set of reforms for the kingdom that has three core aims. Firstly, to build a vibrant society. Secondly, a thriving economy. And thirdly, to transform Saudi Arabia into an ambitious nation. It is this vision that provides the platform for Saudi Arabia's current global deal makings. Though the key question to ask is what's motivated this vision of the future currently sweeping across the desert kingdom. Studies suggest that this reform agenda is driven by three coinciding headwinds facing the Saudi economy. The end of a decade-long run in high oil prices, high population growth rates, and the very costly demands of generous state services and subsidies. Now, it will come as a surprise to few that the fate of the Saudi economy has been directly linked to the price of oil since the discovery of the black gold back in 1938. According to OPEC, Saudi Arabia possesses around 18% of the world's proven petroleum reserves, being the world's largest exporter. However, it is the sheer scale of the kingdom's dependency on the black gold that may startle you. The oil and gas sector accounts for a whopping 50% of the country's gross domestic product, and about 70% of export earnings overall. That's 70 cents in every dollar earned by the wealthy kingdom. Such oil wealth has provided a bounty for the kingdom's coffers for years. The share of the government's revenue derived from oil sales have averaged 80% over the years, with dependency at its greatest between 2010 and 2014, when it accounted for an unbelievable 90% of all government revenue. Such levels of dependency on only one source of revenue are inadvisable for a company, let alone a whole country, especially a commodity at the mercy of the markets, as this graph shows. It is the decline in the price of oil since 2014 which has created a big economic headache for the Saudis in the last five years. This decline in their most valuable export is largely to blame for the kingdom's burgeoning public deficits, which reached 17% in 2018 according to Forbes, and accounted for an eye-watering $100 billion in 2016 alone. And remember, this was all at a time when the global economy was flying high, with global GDP averaging 3.7% in 2018, according to the IMF. Falling government revenues have been made worse over the years by high population growth. The Saudi population has doubled since the 70s, and grows at more than 2% per year. The private sector accounts for less than 50% of the country's GDP. When you add in a rapidly growing population, and a high unemployment level of about 11%, with youth unemployment at about 30%, this creates a financial recipe for disaster. All these factors of falling oil revenues, high population growth, high unemployment, and a general reliance on the state to provide jobs makes the kingdom's 2030 vision even more compelling and urgent. Though, how is this vision being implemented? The economics of the vision are largely being driven by the Public Investment Fund of Saudi Arabia, the kingdom's very own sovereign wealth fund. A sovereign wealth fund is a state-owned investment fund or entity. It is commonly established from commodity or export surpluses by a country. The purpose of each fund varies depending on the unique situation of the state in question, but most commonly they are used to stabilise a budget, diversify an economy, or increase socio-economic development. Sovereign wealth funds are nothing new, and studies show that they are actually heavily correlated with commodity-linked wealth with a number of neighbouring Gulf states utilising them as a vehicle to capitalise on their windfall of oil revenue. In Saudi Arabia's case, the Sovereign Wealth Fund is not designed as a savings fund, but as a stabilisation and development fund. The revenue from the fund is intended to cushion the state budget from fluctuations in oil prices, 
act as a catalyst to creating jobs at home, and attract talent from abroad. The fund was set up in 1971, though it only really started gaining traction under the new Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman in 2015. For most of the fund's existence, the fund was a sleepy backwater of limited economic value, investing predominantly in fixed income securities, hardly the stuff of visions. The vast majority of the kingdom's state wealth was handled by the Saudi Central Bank, acting as the kingdom's substitute sovereign wealth fund. This was a highly unusual move for a central bank to take, given that a central bank's core mandate is usually to protect the value of its currency, and in Saudi Arabia's case, to protect the rial's peg against the dollar. This currency pegging is hugely important for the Saudis, because as seen, their currency is highly dependent on one income stream with little diversification. In order to defend this peg, the central bank has to be able to buy and sell vast quantities of dollars, the international reserve currency of the world, into the open market. The cost for the Saudis of this operation is estimated to require its central bank to hold $300 billion in reserve. This is an absolutely huge amount of money to keep in reserve and creates a problem for their sovereign wealth fund, because to say the fund was ambitious would be an understatement. Its goal is to be the largest sovereign wealth fund by 2030, aiming for assets under management of $2 trillion. To put this in context, the largest sovereign wealth fund in the world today is Norway's government pension fund, which reached $1.1 trillion in 2019, and is generally considered the gold standard in sovereign wealth fund management. So, for the public investment fund to want to almost double the value of Norway's fund in the next decade, is nothing short of ambitious. The public investment fund's current holdings were estimated to be $325 billion in Q1 2020, an increase of over 200% since 2015. In 2020 alone, the public investment fund's program has a number of goals, including growing the value of the fund to $400 billion, holding 25% of its investments abroad, making 4-5% returns for top investors, and generating 20,000 jobs. Ultimately, the fund seeks to become a $2 trillion global investment powerhouse, the likes of which the world has never seen. Considering the list of the top 10 sovereign wealth funds, the Public Investment Fund ranks 9th according to the Sovereign Wealth Institute. To facilitate growth up the global rankings to take the international top spot, money will need to be found for the fund, and lots of it. Much more than the fund currently has on hand. Remember how the Saudi Central Bank used to be the main custodian of wealth in the kingdom? Well, whilst it will always play a crucial role in the economy, it transferred $40 billion into the Public Investment Fund in May 2020. This is typically a highly unusual move for a central bank to take. Then again, given the unusual nature of the Saudi Central Bank to begin with, this goes a long way to explaining the action. However, what we mustn't forget is that Saudi Arabia still needs a large amount of foreign currency reserves typically held by its central bank in order to defend the real and its peg against the dollar, with analysts suggesting that the central bank would need $300 billion at least to effectively defend the peg. At the same time, however, its foreign reserves have declined dramatically over the last five years as a direct consequence of lower oil prices and corresponding large state deficits over the last couple of years. This has led to a rapid decline in the kingdom's foreign currency reserves, from over $700 billion to an estimated $440 billion at the beginning of 2020. If the decline in foreign reserves continues and the economic reforms do not take hold, this could present a huge risk to not only the fund itself, but also the whole Vision 2030 program, and even the very stability of the kingdom. The stakes, therefore, could not be greater. However, the state does have other ways to raise finance for the sovereign wealth fund. Chief among them are other state-owned enterprises and borrowing. The most high-profile state-owned enterprise is Saudi Aramco, which holds the ownership rights to the kingdom's vast oil wealth, a wealth that most people put at over $2 trillion. The initial public offering of Aramco for less than a 2% stake in the oil giant has raised nearly $30 billion, with the intention to plough most of the money raised into the sovereign wealth fund itself. In addition to selling shares and state assets, in the summer of 2018, the Sovereign Wealth Fund received an $11 billion loan from an international banking consortium on the same favourable terms that the Kingdom itself could raise money at. Overall, the Kingdom aims to pay for any borrowing through generating good returns, targeting 4-5% in 2020 alone. However, the Fund's returns have had a chequered past. 
Take the example of the fund's $45 billion investment in SoftBank's flagship Vision Fund, which invests in companies before they go public. In the year to March 2020, the Vision Fund lost nearly $18 billion in value, whilst holding assets including WeWork and Uber. Some critics have highlighted that the fund is at additional exposure to risk because it lacks the same level of transparency as funds such as Norway's government pension fund. Though concerns are not limited to economic concerns alone, there is also concern amongst critics that the fund is a power play between factions of the Saudi royal court. By transferring the wealth of the nation from the central bank and other entities to the fund, there is concern over the financial and therefore political power this could lead to. Not only that, but from a foreign policy perspective, there are suggestions that the fund could act as a platform to improve Saudi Arabia's international image through investments in high-profile entities like football clubs and perhaps key pieces of national infrastructure. That is perhaps why countries over the years are becoming increasingly aware of the geopolitical element sovereign wealth funds can offer. Take Germany, for example. In 2009, an amendment was passed to Germany's Foreign Investment Act. It gave powers to the Federal Economics Ministry to verify whether a stake of 25% or above taken by a non-EU investor in a German company posed a threat to public order and security. If it does, it can impose conditions on the purchase or prohibit it altogether. However, its scope for controlling sovereign wealth funds is in fact rather limited. For a start, few sovereign wealth funds take 25% stakes or greater. Almost all have been lower. Firms can also apply for a certificate of non-harm, which protects them against any action under the law. And there is also a strict time limit, as the Ministry must start its investigation within three months of the share purchase, and then complete it within a further two months. After this period, the Sovereign Wealth Fund investment is deemed accepted by default. Nonetheless, such laws show that countries are willing to scrutinise Sovereign Wealth Funds if necessary. Now, before we come to the end of this video, the content has provided us with a few takeaways on Saudi Arabia's sovereign wealth fund. Perhaps more than anything else, the public investment fund can be considered an integral instrument of Vision 2030. That it is an ambitious attempt to address the headwinds facing the Saudi economy, or the geopolitical element that sovereign wealth funds can play as a foreign policy tool. How the sovereign wealth fund will continue to grow, to be the largest globally, in the next decade without a helping hand from a reverse in the trend of lower oil prices and public deficits depleting foreign reserves needed to defend the real's peg against the dollar is still open for debate. As we come to the end of this video, sovereign wealth funds are clearly a huge topic and something we haven't been able to cover every aspect we would have liked to. Though I hope this has left you with a more informed opinion on Saudi Arabia's public investment fund, alongside some of the challenges both it and the Saudi economy are facing. We would love to hear what your thoughts are in the comments below. And if you like this video, please do remember to give it a like and subscribe. See you in the next video.